sorry. So some of this is, is pretty new to me, um, but we should be recording now. Uh, so, all right. So, so first of all, I want to say, I mean, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really like thrilled that there are this many people like interested in uh, talking about this stuff. Um, so uh, the, the, the plan of this, of this course is um, we are going to uh, give at least one rigorous definition of spectra um, and talk about some, some applications of them uh, towards the end. Um, there, are, there are sort of two main references that I'm following. Um, one is this book by, uh, by um, Barnes and Reutzheim. Um, and the main appeal of this book is that it is that it uh, talks a fair amount about um, about how to define spectra and sort of a modern like model categorical framework. It talks about um, some of the the different models that exist now, um, and so it's called I think it's called Foundations of Stable Homotopy Theory. Uh, and the other one is Adams's Blue Book. Um, so this is called stable homotopy and generalized homology. Um, and this is, this is where I feel like I learned a lot of this stuff from. Uh, it was written in the seventies. So, so he was not really aware of, um, of most of the, the categorical formalism that, that we have now for, for dealing with this stuff. Uh, and so he, he, I think, defines spectra in a pretty naive way and then just starts doing computations with them. And, um, and if you're mostly interested in the applications and not in the, in the foundations, then, um, then that can be, I think, very enjoyable to read. And it's uh, all the stuff that, that we'll be talking about is in part three of this book. Um, so the other two parts are uh, considerably more advanced and should be ignored if you're, if you're looking at this book. Um, Okay, and if there are other, I don't know, admin issues, anything that anyone wants to talk about, I obviously, if you feel like asking a question, you can either ask it in the chat um, or you can just interrupt me. Uh, it would be better if you interrupted me because I, I may not always be able to see the chat. Um, and uh, and um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, and I'll plan on talking for an hour a week or whoever is talking should talk for an hour a week and then we can kind of hang out afterwards and um, answer any questions that people have or anything like that. Uh, okay, so um, so today what I want to do is is give a bunch of motivation. Uh, I think that there there are a couple different ideas that go into building the category of spectra. They're they're um, they're sort of different different metaphors for what spectra should be, and so I'm going to introduce about three or four of those, and I'm also going to Along the way, review some of the uh, some of the things that we will need to remember from um, from algebraic topology. Uh, so, so the first um, the first idea that I want to talk about is uh, suspension. So we'll be doing a lot of things in, in the category of spaces. Um, when I write spaces, I mean something like uh, compactly generated weak Hausdorff spaces or simplicial sets. If you don't know what any of this means, um, ask me later, but the point is I want to avoid point set technicalities. Um, and there is a, a pointed version of this. So this is pointed spaces. And given any two spaces x and y, we can define the set of pointed homotopy classes of maps from x to y. Um, and pointed spaces also have a monoidal structure, um, which is called the smash product. So the definition of oops, the definition of the smash product is x smash y 
for two pointed spaces x and y is the Cartesian product mod the, the wedge of the two spaces. So mod everything that's something times a base point of one of the spaces. Um, this, has, uh, this has a monoidal unit, which is the, the zero sphere. So the suspension of a space um, is S1 smash X. Another way of defining this is you cross X with an interval. And then you quotient by the endpoints of the interval, as well as the interval times the base point. Um, sometimes this is called uh, reduced suspension. Um, so for example, the suspension of Sn, the n-sphere is uh, the n plus 1 sphere. OK, so why is this operation interesting? Um, well, one thing that you can do with it is if you have uh, if you have a map from x to y, you can suspend it to get a map from the suspension of x to the suspension of y. So this defines a suspension operation on sets of homotopy classes. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, you could you could say like, well, this is there are lots of things that I could do to spaces. Why why should I care specifically about this thing? Um, so let's make a couple observations about this map. Uh, the first observation is that these maps uh, preserve at least some information. So this is the content of the Freudenthal suspension theorem. The Freudenthal suspension theorem says that if X is a CW complex of dimension less than or equal to 2n, and if Y is n connected, so this means that the homotopy groups of Y vanish uh, in degrees up to and including n, then the suspension map is an isomorphism. OK, um, there, there are a few consequences of this that are pretty easy to write down. One is that if Y is N connected, then we get isomorphisms on homotopy groups. Induced by these suspension maps. In degrees less than or equal to 2N. Um, in particular, if we take the sphere, um, so the, the n sphere would be n minus 1 connected, because it's first n minus 1 homotopy groups vanish. Uh, and you can check that this, um, after doing some addition and subtraction and stuff, uh, that you get these isomorphisms for n greater than or equal to k plus 2. Okay, So for example, um, let's think about the case when k is equal to 1. So when k is equal to 1, these maps are supposed to be isomorphisms for n at least equal to 3. Um, and these, these homotopy groups are not that hard to compute. So pi 1 of the 0 sphere is 0. Uh, pi 2 of the 1 sphere 
is also 0. Pi 3 of the 2 sphere is z. So this is generated by the, the Hopf vibration. Um, and, uh, and I guess you, you can check that it's z by using the long exact sequence associated to the, the Hopf vibration whose, um, whose fiber is S1. And then from this point onwards, it's z mod 2. So these further groups are all generated by suspensions of the Hopf vibration. Um, and in this case, the, the bound given by the theorem is, is strict. They, the maps start being isomorphisms um, starting when n is equal to 3. So um, people often say that the Freudenthal suspension theorem is kind of the starting point for stable homotopy theory. Um, and that's, that's not really true. Uh, as a matter of fact, we won't be thinking much about this theorem at all. Um, the point of this theorem is that it allows you to take uh, stable ideas and relate them to unstable ideas. So what people do now is they'll say define uh, so define the the kth stable homotopy group of spheres to be the co-limit of of these maps as n goes to infinity, or the, the co-limit of these groups as n goes to infinity. And then this, the Freudenthal suspension theorem lets you identify this stable homotopy group with a certain unstable homotopy group. Um, and then in theory, you can try to figure out what the rest of the unstable homotopy groups are by some, some various other methods. Um, but most of what we're doing is, is strictly in the stable realm. So the problem of identifying it with unstable results um, won't really be of interest to us. Okay, so this is one observation that we can make about suspension. The other observation is that there are many other topological phenomena which are also stable under suspension. Um, so for example, if you take the, the cohomology of a space, so the, just to remind you that tilde means reduced cohomology, which is a thing you can define for pointed spaces, then you have this suspension isomorphism, uh, which says that this is isomorphic to, um, to the cohomology of the suspension with a shift. Uh, and this preserves certain structure. So it, this preserves, um, the action of the Steenrod operations if we're working with mod p homology. Uh, it doesn't preserve the cup product. But oftentimes, interesting things that we can say using the cup product can also be phrased in terms of the Steenrod operation. So, so we can take. Um, so, so we can we can phrase uh, many interesting things about cohomology of spaces as as uh, as stable things. Um, another example is um, so we could consider the group. of n manifolds with some structure. So this could be some kind of complex structure, an orientation, a spin structure. And so on up to Bordism. So roughly speaking, what this means is if you have two manifolds with this structure, um, I think I'm actually contractually obligated to draw a pair of pants here. Uh, 
if you have two manifolds with this with this structure and um, and you can draw an n plus one manifold in between them, who's uh, with with the same sort of structure, whose whose boundary is equal to the disjoint union of these manifolds that we're talking about, then that's a bordism between the two manifolds. So um, it's a problem of of great historical interest in topology to to understand these these bordism groups. Um, so let's write uh, let's write board board G N to be the bordism group of N manifolds with G structure. So G stands for one of these types of structures I've been talking about. Um, so as stated, this is a very unstable question. This, this depends very much on the, on the dimension of the manifolds that you're talking about. Um, uh, Tom realized, however, that, um, that you could define these spaces which are now called Tom spaces And with the property that this nth bordism group is equal to the co-limit as k goes to infinity of pi n plus k mgk. Okay, so so um, so when phrased this way, there, there's clearly something stable lurking beneath the surface, um, and it turns out that these these Tom spaces actually assemble into a spectrum. Um, okay, so uh, so these are some examples of some some phenomena in topology that seem unstable but are actually secretly stable. Uh, so so one attempt to understand these this phenomena is what's called the Spanier Whitehead category. Uh, So this is the category whose objects are pairs x n, where x is a finite CW complex, and n is an integer. Um, maps in the Spanier Whitehead category from Xn to Ym are defined to be the co-limit as k goes to infinity of, I'm realizing now that I should have said um, X is a pointed finite CW, CW complex. Right, so this is the, the co-limit of um, maps from the n plus k fold suspension of x to the m plus k fold suspension of y. Okay, so um, even if n and m are negative, you can suspend high enough so that these, these are actually well-defined uh, spaces. And using the Freudenthal suspension theorem, you can, you can control um, you, you can control this co-limit. So you can say this co-limit is attained at a finite stage, and you can even say which precisely which finite stage it's attained at. Uh, one interesting feature that this category has is that uh, x comma n plus m is isomorphic in this category to suspension n of x comma m. So what we can do is we can think of Uh, let's say x, x n as a formal suspension or desuspension of x. Okay, so in this category, in this category, we've made suspension uh, invertible.
So as an example of the sort of thing that you can do with this category, um, in, in spaces, there, there's a composition product on homotopy groups of spheres. So if I give you a map from SA to SB and a map from SB to SC, then I can compose them to get a map from SA to SC. Okay, but this is only partially defined. The, in order to define this composition product, the output sphere of the first map and the input sphere of the, of the second map have to match each other. Um, so in the Spaniard Whitehead category, uh, we can compose, um, we, can, can, we can multiply together, I guess, any two classes in, in the homotopy groups of spheres. Um, and this, this, makes, uh, this makes the homotopy groups of spheres a graded ring. So, um, so we have this, this group, which is defined as the direct sum of of all these maps between the different spheres. Um, and this is a graded ring. There are still many missing pieces here. Um, one thing is we've defined sort of a set of homotopy classes between pairs of objects in this category, but uh, it's a bit harder to define a space of maps between objects in this category. And, and you have a space of maps between any two topological spaces. Uh, it, it's also difficult to deal with infinitary phenomena. Um, for example, the Tom spectra that I mentioned a second ago, or things having to do with, uh, with generalized cohomology theories. Um, there's sort of a naive generalization to, to infinite dimensional chain complexes, but I'll just say that that, that gives the wrong answer. Um, so the, the first kind of idea for where spectra, for where spectra come from is they, they come from this construction. Um, so So spectra are supposed to contain infinite suspensions of any pointed space X. If we just think about pointed finite CW complexes, then spectra should contain um, the Spanier Whitehead category in some sense. Uh, moreover, suspension should be invertible. So we can do things like define this graded ring of, of homotopy groups of spheres, as we were talking about a second ago. Okay, um, so maybe I'll pause there and uh, ask if there are any questions. Um, yeah, I'm a bit confused about uh, if you go up a bit, um, yeah. just what pi star of s is supposed to be. What is s? Right. So, so s is this the sphere uh, in quotes. Um, so, what we've done here is we've assembled uh, all of the all of the homotopy groups of spheres that appear in the Spanier Whitehead category into a sim into a single object. Um, so, if you take uh, so m maybe to explain that a bit. Um, if you have any object in the Spanier Whitehead category that looks like uh, S n comma m, then this is isomorphic to uh, S zero comma something. I think n plus m. And also, since suspension is invertible, if we map into any object like this, uh, we can formally suspend or desuspend both sides to make it so that the target has a zero in this spot. Um, so, so any of these. Any map between spheres in the Spanier in the Spanier Whitehead category can be identified with a with a an element of this ring. Does that make sense? Should I? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just a little. Yeah. Sure. Like, is S? Um, so S is like a universal sphere. Like. Yeah. So so S is a thing that we will ultimately call the sphere spectrum. Um, oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But but for now, you can just think of this as kind of a formal symbol that that 
acknowledges the fact that we're combining all of these all of these things into one object. I don't know. Other questions? So was this category created before Spectra? Like, what's the timeline? My understanding is yes, although I've never actually like read the papers where the people do this. I, I think that this was defined in the in the fifties, and Spectra started being defined in the early sixties. But I could be wrong. Okay, um, so let's keep going. Um, let me let me remind you of another another fact from uh, from from algebraic topology, or another idea, uh, which is the idea of generalized cohomology theories. So these are functors from pointed spaces to, oh, sorry, from the opposite category of pointed spaces to graded abelian groups, such that E star is homotopy invariant. So in other words, if you have two homotopic maps between spaces, then they induce the same map on cohomology. And, and that also implies that two homotopy equivalent spaces have isomorphic cohomology rings. Um, second, there are suspension isomorphisms. which are natural in X. Um, third, if you have an inclusion of, of spaces, then there's an exact sequence um, on cohomology And finally, E star takes coproducts of spaces to products of greater abelian groups. Okay, so this is this is one version of the Eilenberg-Steen rod axioms. You'll notice that I'm talking specifically about reduced cohomology. It's possible to define unreduced cohomology from this. So, um, so maybe I'll just briefly say that. Uh, the unreduced version is that if I have an unpointed space, then its unreduced cohomology is uh, the reduced cohomology of the space together with the disjoint base point. Um, and likewise, we can define cohomology of a of a pair and, and other stuff like that. Uh, but I'm mostly interested in this version because of this suspension isomorphism, which looks a whole lot like some of the things that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the point of these axioms is that if you have a CW complex, you sort of build it up cell by cell. And what these axioms let you do is they let you compute the cohomology of the CW complex in terms of the cohomology of the cells. Um, and I, I, I won't say anything detailed about that, but um, essentially you can use uh, axioms three and four to reduce the computation of E star X to E star of spheres.
And then you can use axiom two, the suspension isomorphism to reduce this to E star of the zero sphere, which is the same as the unreduced cohomology of a point. So, um, so one of the most interesting questions that can be asked about a cohomology theory is what's the cohomology of a point? Uh, of course, that doesn't automatically tell you the cohomology of everything else, but but it it's at least a, a step in the right direction. So a couple examples, um, we can take ordinary cohomology of spaces with coefficients in an arbitrary ring R. And in this case, the, the cohomology of the zero sphere with coefficients in R is just R. Um, a more complicated example is given by K-theory. So we define KU0 of X to be the group completion of the monoid of isomorphism classes of complex vector bundles over X. Okay, so this is a monoid under direct sum and, and we're allowing ourselves to, to add formal inverses of, of direct sums. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, were you able to get excision out of those axioms? I think so, yeah. So I think, um, so, so excision is usually defined on pairs, right? Um, and I, I think I think that what you do is if you have a if you have a pair you define its unreduced cohomology to be the the reduced cohomology of the the uh, the mapping cone of the pair. Um, and I I think that this exact sequence implies excision, although it's it's been forever since I've actually sort of thought about this, so I could be wrong about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, other questions. I guess likewise, I was a little bit confused about the, um, if you mm -hmm. shift the triangle, mm -hmm. you make a long exact sequence. How, how do you get from just this version? Right, so you, you get from this version to a long exact sequence because of the fact that um, you can extend these. Uh, and I should write this down actually, because we will be um, you know, using this at some point in the future. Um, so if, if we start with an inclusion uh, A into X, um, then we can define the, the, the quotient. Um, but this is equivalent to the mapping cone. So X union the cone of A um, along this. And now this map from X to the cone is, a, is, a, is an inclusion of a, of a subcomplex as well. Um, so we can continue this, uh, this sequence by, um, by taking the quotient of this inclusion. And it turns out that the quotient of this inclusion is equivalent to the suspension of A. Um, so if you keep going, you, you get uh, a, a, a sequence of spaces which are connected by these, um, by these, these inclusions of subcomplexes. And then uh, you can apply the cohomology theory to each of the spaces in the sequence. And since you know that the, the cohomology theory or the associated sequence is exact at each point, you end up with a long exact sequence. Does that make sense? So it, so it, it comes from this topological fact that you can continue these um, these cofiber sequences arbitrarily far. Thanks. Yep, cool. Um, OK, so back to K-theory. Uh, so this is KU upper 0 of x. There's likewise um, a reduced version. Uh, so this is just the kernel. If we have a pointed space, we can think about the kernel of KU 0 x to KU 0 of the base point. Um, since complex vector bundles over a point are just complex vector spaces, uh, this is sort of like checking the dimension of your of your vector bundle. Um, so, and that if X is connected, then that's that's literally true. Um, and so, what this is saying is, uh, give me the the classes in this group completion which have which have sort of dimension zero. 
Um, so formal differences of vector bundles with, with dimension zero. So, um, so likewise, uh, in order to, to make the suspension isomorphism work, we need to define KU minus N of X to be KU zero of the n-fold suspension of X for N greater than zero. Um, but this, this does not define us a cohomology theory because, um, because we haven't defined it for all indices. So there's a trick that lets us extend this to, to positive indices in this case, and that trick is bot periodicity. Uh, so bot periodicity says that that KU zero of X is naturally isomorphic to KU zero of the two-fold suspension of X. So now we can define KU n of X for, for any n uh, to be KU n of some large even suspension of X, which is supposed to be the same as um, KU n minus 2k of X. And the naturality of this isomorphism tells us that uh, that it doesn't it doesn't matter which which suspension we choose here as long as it's large enough to make this exponent negative. Okay, so this defines a a cohomology theory. Um, uh, and I should I should say by the way that that actually checking that this is a cohomology theory is is like not not a trivial thing. Um, there's there's a bunch of things that actually have to be checked, uh, but it is um, the cohomology of the zero sphere. is of the form polynomials in beta with beta inverted, where the degree of beta is two. And this is sort of the, the class that represents bot periodicity. OK, so this example shows you that there are some interesting cohomology theories where the coefficient ring is not concentrated in, in degree 0. Um, likewise, we could talk about real vector bundles, and there's a version of bot periodicity that works in that case as well. So, so there's another cohomology theory um, for, for real vector bundles. Okay, so, um, so the second metaphor that, that goes into the definition of spectra is that since cohomology theories are stable invariants of a space, they should in some sense be definable in terms of spectra rather than, um, rather than spaces. Uh, so a better thing to say is that they should be representable on the level of spectra. So this is the content of the Brown representability theorem. Um, maybe let me first say that to any space X, uh, I can't remember if I said this already or not, but, but to any space X, there's a, an associated spectrum, um, which is called the suspension spectrum of X. So this is, this is a point in space. This is a spectrum. Um, and you could you could think of this suspension spectrum as defined uh, the way these objects in the in the Spanier Whitehead category were defined. So the Brown representability theorem says that for any cohomology theory E star, there is a spectrum. E such that um, such that E n of x is maps from the n fold d suspension 
of the suspension spectrum of X into E. Okay. Um, so to make sense of this, we have to remember that one of the one of the features that we wanted of spectra is that suspension is invertible on spectra. So it makes sense to talk about desuspensions of things. Um, if this looks confusing to you, uh, don't worry too much about it. It's it will it will make sense in time. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and I should probably mention, although I, I won't say this in much detail, that uh, one can do a similar thing for homology theories. So there's there's a way to um, what there there are analogous axioms that define homology theories, and likewise homology theories can be represented by spectra. Okay, um, so the third sort of metaphor comes from infinite loop spaces. So to tell you about this, I, I can explain a little bit more about where the Brown rep representability theorem comes from. Um, so originally, I'm actually, I'm not 100% sure about the history here, but, but part of the theorem is a theorem about spaces. So, so, um, so Brown showed that for any cohomology theory E, E star, there are spaces um, let's say en such that en of x is homotopy classes of maps of pointed spaces from x into this space en. Okay, so, so this requires much less uh, sort of machinery to prove. Um, so for, uh, for example, talking about the, the cohomology theories, which we've already mentioned, the ordinary cohomology of a space with coefficients in a ring R is the same as maps from X into an eilenberg maclean space. So this is the space um, whose nth homotopy group is R and whose other homotopy groups are zero. Likewise, if we talk about complex K theory, then this is either maps from X into Z cross BU if N is even, or it's maps from X into the loop space of Z cross BU if N is odd. So one of the features that these cohomology theories were supposed to have is this suspension isomorphism. And that says, if we interpret it through the lens of this representability theorem, it says that maps from X into the space EN are supposed to be naturally isomorphic to maps from suspension of X into the space EN plus one. Um, now suspension is left adjoint to loops. So this is the same as maps from X into loops EN plus one. Um, since this isomorphism is natural in X on the homotopy category, then the unital lemma gives us a, an, a homotopy equivalence between EN and the loop space of EN plus one. And likewise, this is isomorphic to loops two of EN plus two and so on and so on. So this means that the space EN is what's called an infinite loop space. So an infinite loop space is just a space that's isomorphic, or sorry, that's 
homotopy equivalent to an n-fold loop space for, for every n. So for example, going back to, to these two examples, which, which we've been talking about, um, these eilenberg maclean spaces, KRN, uh, these are equivalent to loops on KRN plus one, and so on and so on. Um, also, an, another way of describing bod periodicity is that if you take loops two of Z cross VU, so first of all, this is the same as loops two of the connected component of the base point, which is just VU, um, and bot periodicity says that this is equivalent to Z cross VU. Okay, so Z cross VU is an infinite loop space. So one of the reasons that one cares about these spaces, besides the, their relationship to generalized cohomology theories, uh, is that they have a, a rich sort of algebraic structure to them. Uh, so if, if x is just a single loop space, let's say x is loops on x prime, then there's a multiplication map on x, which just comes from concatenating loops. Um, this map defines a, a uh, it defines something like a, like a group structure on x. So it's, it's not associative on the nose, but it's associative up, up to homotopy. And moreover, these, these homotopies are, are coherent in a certain highly structured way. Um, and likewise, uh, loops don't have strict inverses, but they have they have homotopy inverses, which are given by going backwards around the exact same loop. Um, so one of the things that this does is, uh, is it forces homotopy classes of maps from any other space A into X to be a group. If X is a double loop space, Then likewise, uh, maps from A into X is an abelian group. And in this case, the, the loop multiplication on X is, is commutative up to homotopy. And again, th those homotopies are sort of coherent. Uh, so one way of thinking about infinite loop spaces is that um, an infinite loop space has what's called an E infinity algebra structure. So this is a multiplication that's uh, associative and commutative up to homotopy. Up to a homotopy that's as coherent as possible. So I'm, I'm not defining this, but 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 it's something that you can define in terms of in terms of some vast sequence of diagrams commuting. So there's a theorem about these things, which is that suppose x is an E infinity algebra, and pi zero of x is a group. The, the E infinity algebra axioms only force it to be a monoid. So we'll require that it's a group. Then uh, X is equivalent as an E infinity algebra. T 
to an infinite loop space. So the point of this is that these objects are, are um, related to, to generalized cohomology theories, but they, they also admit this, this sort of intrinsic, um, almost algebraic definition, which, which doesn't say anything about, about the existence of these deloopings. So the third metaphor is that every infinite loop space is associated to a spectrum and vice versa. So given a spectrum E, there is an associated infinite loop space, loops infinity of E. Conversely, given it an infinite loop space, uh, we can lift it to, to a spectrum. Um, this is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. An infinite loop space generally corresponds to, to many different spectra. Um, one of the properties that this, that this uh, construction has is that uh, maps in spectra from the suspension spectrum of a space into a spectrum E are the same as maps in spaces from X to the infinite loop space of E. And this connects the, the two versions of Brown representability, one of them for spectra, one of them for spaces. OK. So the last thing I want to mention, um, the, the last reason for thinking about spectra is, uh, is that the category of spectra has some, some interesting uh, formal properties as well. Um, so one way of describing them is, like I mentioned, in, in spaces, we can talk about these cofiber sequences. So uh, you can think about the inclusion of a subcomplex A into a CW complex X. You can form the mapping cone. You can form the mapping cone of this next map, and this gives you the suspension of X, or sorry, the suspension of A, and so on and so on. Um, so this is called a cofiber sequence. And the point of thinking about cofiber sequences is that they induce uh, a long exact sequence on cohomology as well as on homology. There's a dual construction, which is if we start with a fibration E to B, we can take its, uh, its fiber um, and if we do this in a, in, a, in a nice homotopically invariant way, then we can likewise continue the construction backwards. Um, and again, there's a sort of periodicity to this. Uh, the, next, the next objects that appear in this sequence are, um, are the loops of the objects before, the loop spaces of the objects before. So this is called a fiber sequence. The reason we care about fiber sequences is that um, these things induce a long exact sequence on homotopy groups. So um, one can try to form these, these uh, things like this in any category that in a certain sense is like the category of spaces. Um, so we'll eventually learn a, a framework for talking about this stuff, which is the framework of model categories. Um, the category of spectra is special because it's a category uh, like the category of spaces in which fiber sequences are cofiber sequences and vice versa.
Um, the fact that suspension is invertible is, uh, is, is a consequence of this fact. So the, the reason I'm mentioning this is that uh, categories like this, um, I haven't precisely said what like this means, but categories like this are actually well known outside of topology. So, um, so other examples of such phenomena are the derived category of a ring R. So this is the, the category of chain complexes over R, um, where I've, I've declared two chain complexes to be uh, equivalent if they're um, quasi-isomorphic to each other. So, uh, so there's an abstract framework for talking about this, um, which is the framework of stable model categories. or stable infinity categories. And in these frameworks, the category of spectra has a universality property. Um, so this is, a, this is a theorem, which I'm stating in a form due to Lurie, but uh, I think these, these ideas kind of um, in other forms were, were known before, before he wrote them down. Uh, and this is also metaphor four. So the category of spectra is the free presentable stable infinity category on one object. It's also the initial presentably symmetric monoidal stable infinity category. So you're, you're not expected to know, know what any of this means. Um, what, uh, the, what I want you to take away from it is, is the fact that if one cares about categories like say chain complexes over a ring, um, one might also be, be interested in the category of spectra for, for kind of purely formal reasons that, that related to categories of this form. Um, one, one sort of fact which I'll mention, which is, which is related to this theorem is that uh, these derived categories of rings can actually be defined inside the category of spectra. So this is equivalent to the category of modules um, inside spectra Uh, wait, how do you, how do you write things down? I don't remember. Um, so the category of modules over the spectrum HR inside spectra and what HR is, is it's the thing that represents ordinary cohomology with coefficients in R. Okay. Um, so that's, that's it for sort of the, the, the prelude to all of this. Um, when we meet again next week, I'll start talking about some, some background, especially saying a little more about these fiber and cofiber sequences. Um, and I will also probably start talking about model categories, which are which are like the the framework that we'll use to to make these definitions. Um, yeah. So, uh, are there any questions? I can stop the recording if that would make it easier for people to ask questions. Uh, would you Would you mind saying again what uh? So I guess like sigma infinity is yeah. uh, like a co-limit or? 
So, so it's a, it's not really a co-limit. It's, it's a construction that allows you to take a space and turn it into a spectrum. Um, and the, the, the simple way to think about it is, is it's, it's like talking about when you're talking about suspension spectra of spaces, you're talking about spaces up to arbitrarily high suspension. Um, so in particular, at least, at least if we're dealing with finite, uh, with finite complexes, then maps between suspension spectra of finite complexes should be the same as maps from, uh, as this co-limit of, of maps between their suspensions. Okay. And in the analogy with homological algebra, are we supposed mm -hmm. to think of those things as like a, a single module sitting in degree zero or? Uh, what, what do you mean by those things? Um, yeah, no, I think, I guess, I guess I'm being a little bit imprecise. Um, I mean, this is somehow the inclusion from spaces into spectra, right? Uh, this, yeah. Yeah. But the, so, I guess they're not really sitting in degree zero in any meaningful way. Right. So if you, if you have a CW complex, you can think of it as sort of like a chain complex um, built out of, of spheres in, in, in a loose sense, right? Uh, and in that analogy, I would think of the n sphere sitting in degree n. Um, I'm not, I, I assume that's, that's kind of what you're, what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds reasonable, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So actually, Remy, I'm glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that because the one way to think about what we're doing here is that if you if you think of a CW complex as analogous to a chain complex, like um, like I just said, uh, then then it's a chain complex that starts in degree zero and and sort of goes up into positive degrees. Um, and by replacing spaces with spectra, what you're doing is you're allowing yourself to to have things in negative degrees as well. So, so that's, that's, if you're familiar with homological algebra, that's, that's, I think, a pretty good way to think about it. Okay, uh, let me stop the recording.